Well, we're jumping into chapter 4 of Ezra. So far in chapters 1 and 2, we saw God stirring the hearts of his people to leave Babylon and to go home, to start the work of restoring the temple. And the key to that is that they wanted to restore proper worship of God. And God stirred the heart of the king Cyrus to send them home, and he stirred everyone necessary to go home to do this project. In chapter 3, we saw them beginning to sacrifice as they built the altar and then as they uh, built the temple's foundation. They were doing everything by the book because they wanted to worship God rightly. And the sound of their worship was heard and their worship was seen. And in today's chapter, we see that worship that is both seen and heard will lead to opposition. So I've called this section, Here Comes Trouble. I really do encourage you to take some time and read through the chapter for yourself. Try and get your head around what is happening here. There's a few interesting um, timeline changes happening. We jump ahead from verse 6 onwards, which I'll talk about in a moment. So just take some time to read, familiarize yourself with the story, and note down uh, repetition and interesting things you, you see. Spend some time praying, asking God to help you to understand and learn from this part of his word. And I'm going to highlight some of what I've seen in this section. The main strategy I used to see the structure in this passage was the literary devices tool, where you just look for transition words. In this case, we've got when, but, then, and then all the way at the end here, thus. And also we're given uh, these two statements at the beginning of the reign of Xerxes and in the days of Artaxerxes. So those uh, literary devices uh, help just to see the flow of this scene. And the way I divided up the passage was 1 to 5, 6 all the way down to verse 23. And then verse 24, capping the story off for us. Straight away, as the scene is set, we're told that the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard. Um, so these are a key character in the story. Uh, they're spoken of as the people around them. Now, if you think back to chapter 3, in chapter 3, verse 3, we were told that despite their fear, they built the altar. And they were fearful because they had these enemies. Um, and the enemies are working against them. They are uh, bribing officials to work against them. They are lodging um, accusations against the people. Uh, he mentioned specific enemies who, who wrote the letter to Artaxerxes many years later. Um, so the scene is set by just showing, okay, so there are enemies to the work. Um, they are enemies of Judah and Benjamin, so God's people are, are represented here. And specifically focusing it on Jerusalem as the city where they've gone. And we'll see the enemies in a moment start speaking about uh, that city or this city being a wicked and rebellious city. So it's an attack on Jerusalem, but much more, it's an attack on God's people in Jerusalem. And in that, it's an attack on the God of those people in Jerusalem. As I said, verse 1 to 5 and verse 24 uh, make a unit and we get a, a flash forward in verses 6 to 23. And we see that we've spoken, uh, we are told about the building of the temple of the Lord um, in this section. Um, they are building a temple. And then at the end, we see again, that's the work on the house of God. So that just shows the link where from verse 6 onwards, we've got a timeline jump. And perhaps it's just useful to, to have a look at this timeline. So if we've got uh, 538 is uh, when Cyrus first sent them home, um, 537 
the temple foundation is laid. 536, the work stops. So that's where we are in chapter 4. But then we're also told at, in uh, verse 24 about the second year of Darius. So we know that that is the year 520. Um, so that's when the work starts again. Um, second year of Darius here. And the temple itself was completed in 516 which we read about in Ezra uh, 6 verse 15. So just four years later, temple completed. When it says here in verse 24 that that's the work on the house stopped until the second year of the reign of Darius, so that's a 16-year stop. Then in the story, we also are told about Xerxes. Um, he was king following on from Darius. Uh, 486 to 464. Um, that's the later opposition that's mentioned in 4 verse 6. And you can read more about him in the story of Esther in the Bible. Um, and then following on from Xerxes, you've got Artaxerxes. That's the story from verse 4 verse 7 onwards. Um, and those are the years 464 through to 423. So Artaxerxes, and that's the story that's told very much in uh, Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 1 and 2. We see Nehemiah was cupbearer to King Artaxerxes. Um, in 458, Ezra arrives home. And in 445, Nehemiah arrives home. So that's kind of a, a timeline of the events. What we're seeing here in chapter um, 4 is from this point. So this is chapter 3. This is chapters 1 and 2. And here we've got chapter 4. But chapter 4 ends by speaking about this time until the second year of the reign of Darius when the work starts again. So that's the timeline we're working with. But then when we've got in verse 6 here, the reign of Xerxes, we're jumping ahead to here. And then verse 7, the reign of Artaxerxes, we're jumping ahead again. And the point of this is to show that the opposition to God's work was a norm for God's people. It happened in Cyrus's day. It happened all through Darius's day, it happened in the days of Xerxes and Artaxerxes. Opposition to God's work was a norm. Now, if you read verse 2, it seems like they, they say, we've come to help build this house. Um, but verse 1 called them enemies. So how do we know that their, their help isn't help that's actually wanted? Well, if you go and read 2 Kings 17... Uh, we'll, we read about these people who were settled in the land and we are told that they did sacrifice. Just as they say, we've been sacrificing to your God, but they also were sacrificing to many other gods, worshipping many other gods. So if the Zerubbabel and the leaders here had allowed these guys to help with the project, it would have meant that they would corrupt the whole project. So it's a really good thing that they said we don't need your help because these guys weren't worshippers of God alone. They were worshipping other gods too. And so Zerubbabel and his associates say, nope, this is our work alone. We alone will build it. And then we've got this transition. Then these helpers will help you. All of a sudden the mask comes off and they start making trouble. They are discouraging and working against and frustrating. And then in, when we get this flash forward, we see that they are lodging accusations. And in this case, they stopped the work and they are compelled. They compelled them by force to stop. In this flash forward, we've got these enemies of God's people writing a letter to Artaxerxes and they spin a story. They say, well, this is a rebellious and wicked city. Um, 
They say if you don't sort this out, they're going to stop paying taxes to you. They keep on referring back. Go look in the history. They're a rebellious city full of sedition. You won't be left with anything. So they really are spinning a story to King Artaxerxes and saying, you better stop these guys doing this work. And then Artaxerxes does some research and he finds out that this city does have a history of revolt against kings. And you can read that in 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings. Um, and then he speaks about them having powerful kings ruling over the whole of Trans-Euphrates. Uh, so that's speaking about uh, David and Solomon. So there is truth in what the king finds out and there's elements of truth in what they said here, just as there were elements of truth in saying that they wanted to sacrifice, or they, they sacrificed to God. So they've got just enough truth in all that they're saying to cause trouble for God's people at this point. And King Artaxerxes, if he had done better work, which we see him doing in the book of Nehemiah, he would have seen that Cyrus had told them to go home and to do this work. But in this case, his fear of what might be, um, that they might take away his money and you'll be left with nothing, his fear ended with him saying, now tell these people to stop this work and compel them by force to stop. So what these verses are doing, 6 to 23, are showing that this was the norm. Opposition was persistent for God's people. And actually, that's what we see throughout uh, God's word. Um, God's people never have it easy in this world as they seek to live for God. So Ezra chapter 3 ended with this great shout of joy. The worshippers of God, their worship was, was both seen and heard. But very importantly, that word heard at the end of chapter uh, three is picked up here. The enemies heard it too. And that's an intentional link. When they hear this worship, when they see this building work happening, that worship that is seen and heard leads to opposition. Now, it would have been wonderful if verse five had continued and said, even though there's opposition, uh, you kind of wish that the verse went on and said, but they kept worshiping God. They kept trusting in his faithfulness and they finished the work. But it doesn't say that. When the story is picked up in verse 24, it says, thus the work on the house of God came to a standstill. It stopped. Until the second year, 16 years later, And that's a real tragedy. Yes, in chapter 5 and 6, when a word from the Lord comes from Haggai and Zechariah, they get going again and they do finish the temple. But for 16 years, they stopped. The very work that God had sent them home to do was to build the temple. But they stopped. And in 1 Corinthians 10, we are told that stories like this in the Old Testament are written down as, as an example and as a warning to us. And I think it's important for us to see that just being a worshipping community like they were at the end of chapter 3, just one year later, if you look at this timeline again, it was just one year later that the work stopped. So we must take the warning in a story like this. We need to remain a worshipping community who entrust ourselves to God and lean on his word and pray that he would help us so that the work that he has called us to do would never come to a standstill. And so as you dig further into this story, um, I pray that it would challenge you, stir your own heart, and that for those of you who teach this to, that we would be prayerfully committing to continue with the work that God has called us to that it would never come to a standstill. The wonderful truth for us is as we look at Jesus, he faced more opposition than these guys faced. Um, 
he was the soldiers and the Romans and the leaders of the Jews tried to stop him by force. And they nailed him to a cross. But that work that he was doing didn't come to a standstill. Actually, at that point was his greatest victory. And so for us in Christ, he told us, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. See, he stood firm in the face of the greatest suffering, much greater than any of this suffering we see here. And because he stood firm, we can stand firm in him. So let's pray that he would strengthen us, that the work he's called us to would never come to a standstill, let alone be it for 16 years or 16 months or 16 weeks or 16 days. Let's pray that God's work through us would continue, that he would be greatly glorified as we seek to worship him in ways that are both seen and heard. God bless.